Hello, everyone. Welcome to GDG Johannesburg's um, first Women Tech Makers Meetup for, um, well, ever online. Um, so let me just quickly get to my slides. So just as a way of introduction for GDG Johannesburg, um, what is GDG? Well, it's just a group for developers who are interested in Google's developer technology. So that's Android, Angular, or even Go. So GDG congregates around once a month, every month, between 6 and 8 SAST, which is South Africa Central Time. And you can follow us on uh, meetup.com where you can see all our events and things happening. So you can also tweet at us. We are, um, our Twitter handle is at GDG Johannesburg or hashtag GDG JHB. We do have a code of conduct. Um, so by attending, you agree to this code of conduct. And it's basically just be nice and assume positive intent. So you can also have a look at the details of our um, meetup at that link that you can see over there in the middle. And this is basically just so that we have a harassment-free event experience for everyone. If you feel that someone is not obeying the code of conduct, please email us at gggjohannesburg at gmail.com and we'll get on it right away. So thank you so much to our wonderful sponsors. Firstly, Luno for wonderful speaker gifts and also JetBrains for the raffle prizes at the end. They're giving us two wonderful prizes. So stay until the end so that you can win. Um, while we have normal physical meetups, um, we also have Google and DBT and OfferZen as sponsors. Google helps us with financial support, DDT gives us a venue, and offers in with some really snazzy swag and also some extra speaker gifts. If you'd like to be a speaker, get in touch with us at gdgjohannesburg at gmail.com. Both new and experienced speakers are, avail are, are welcome. We'll even coach you and help you with your slide review or um, your slide reviews or help you with just practicing everything so you're absolutely welcome to come and speak remember that this is for for good this is a google developer group or a women tech makers group so it has to be topics that are relevant to those two kinds of meetups so women tech makers which is what we what, what, what the kind of meetup that we're doing tonight is a organization for women in tech and their allies and you can join by, by going to womentechmakers.com slash membership and just clicking that nice little red button over there. And you can become a member by applying. Um, there's a lot of resources and job opportunities um, available for women tech makers. So make sure that you make use of this wonderful resource that Google provides us. So please tweet at us something interesting with the hashtag GH, uh, GDG JHB or at GGG Johannesburg or at Women Tech Makers. For instance, I would be very excited if somebody like shared a picture of their cat watching GDG Johannesburg, that would rock. Um, but you or your family or anybody watching, you know, you, you with a cup of coffee watching, that would be amazing. Thank you. So today's agenda. So we've done the welcome to GGG. That's a tick. Next up, we're going to have Danae Bennett. Um, and she's going to be sharing her journey from going from a junior engineer to an engineering manager. Then after that, we've got Clara van Staden, the epic Clara van Staden, sharing about how she learned yet another programming language. And then lastly, Lizette Spannenberg, talking about um, with her talk, let me explain it to you and other things women love to hear. Please stay until the end because we're going to have a survey. Now the survey helps us with improving both the speaker's talks and also the meetup itself. And if you fill in the survey, you can win some epic JBrains prizes. So thank you so much for attending. 
And I think it's time for Danae to start speaking. So let's give it a go. Oh, also, last thing. So at the bottom right of your screen, you've been typing in a lot of highs, but you can also ask the speakers questions there. And then your um, questions will appear at the Q&A time um, on screen. Like, for instance, thank you, Peter John. Welcome for saying stop. And we will display SUP right there. So that's the way that we're going to be doing the question and answer stuff. OK, uh, I think that's it for the introductions. Let's get to Danae. Cool. So Danae is a um, engineer manager from Luno. She works in the London office. And she's kindly um, agreed to speak to us about her journey while she's actually on holiday in the English countryside, as one does. Um, so if you hear a squeal in the background, that's just the new baby. Um, but it's cool. Take it away, Danae. Oh, let's. Thanks, Pamela. Let's hope the internet in the English countryside holds up. Um, and let's hope all my windows here are in the right place. Hopefully someone will tell me if they're not. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for listening tonight. Um, and thank you, Pamela, for convincing me to do something that I don't normally do. My name is Danae. As you can hear by my accent, I am a South African, but I'm currently li living in London in the UK um, with my husband. Uh, that's us visiting a castle, um, also as one does. And that is the new baby. Well, she's not that new anymore. She's almost a year old. Um, I am an engineering manager at LUNO, and uh, tonight I'm going to try and share a little bit about my engineering journey with you so far. So I was racking my brains, oh, just an aside, um, if Malcolm Gladwell is right, it takes about 10,000 hours to be good at something, which means that I am about 9,999 hours short of being a good public speaker. <laughs> so please bear with me as I practice this. Um, I was thinking about what I could tell you tonight that was possibly uh, interesting or useful. And after thinking about it for a while, I decided that maybe I would tell you about three times that I almost gave up on engineering and why I didn't. So I graduated back in the day um, with a degree in electrical and computer engineering. And to set the scene, this was software was very different back then. We didn't have Facebook yet. We only had MySpace. We didn't have iPhones, we only had Blackberries, and we didn't have GitHub for version control. We had to use something called SVN or Subversion. Um, so I took my first job at an electronics company, and this was very exciting for me. I got to program all sorts of real-world devices like electricity meters and telephone exchanges, and even this drone in the picture here. It was really good experience um, writing code that reads voltages from all sorts of sensors, like pressure sensors and temperature sensors, um, and code that produces other voltages that control real life things like server mechanisms. Um, I would definitely recommend embedded systems programming to anyone because it really helped solidify some of the fundamentals of computer science for me that I'd learned in university. And it also taught me early on to be very careful with my code because if I made a mistake, if there was a bug, it could, uh, for example, lead to a plane falling out the sky. So this was a great job, it was great experience, and I did it for a couple of years. But after a while, I just wasn't very, um, I just wasn't as happy as I thought I should be. And I didn't, I didn't know why at the time, I didn't know what was happening. But looking back, it does kind of make sense. Um, I was one of a few women in a big building with lots of floors filled with men, and I stuck out like a sore thumb a lot of the time. So I spent a lot of energy just trying to sort of fit in and fly under the radar and, uh, and basically trying to be more masculine, as you can see on my previous slide. <laughs> so yeah, so this wasn't very happy. Um, and I had maybe one or two friends, female friends who were engineers, but I had no role models really. I didn't know any senior engineers who were women um, or any engineering managers who were women. And social networking wasn't what it was today. So I hadn't yet encountered some of the wonderful women like uh, Tracy Chu and Amy Wabowo, who later um, their writing and their talks would mean a lot to me. So I was feeling kind of exhausted. 
just trying to figure out where I fit into this very masculine world of software engineering. And I thought maybe this career wasn't going to be for me. And um, two important things happened around about that time. The first is that I watched uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg's TED talk for the first time. I think it's called uh, Why We Have Too Few Women Leaders. And I know that she's kind of a controversial figure these days, but back then that talk meant a lot to me because it was the first time I heard someone talk about things like the confidence gap. Um, and suddenly it began to make sense to me why my male colleagues seemed so confident in everything they did when I felt so not confident. <laughs> she also spoke about um, things like uh, leaving before you leave, which is basically when women start to hang back in their careers because they start to make space for family and for babies and um, that might come later on before long before that's actually happening, which was um, something that always stayed with me to this day. Uh, but the most important thing is that I realized there were many other women around the world who were experiencing a similar thing to what I was experiencing. And there was nothing wrong with me. Um, I wasn't alone and, uh, and other women face these challenges all the time. So I knew then that I had to make an effort to stay connected to other women. Um, and thankfully the, the internet was making that easier and easier. So I made an effort to always be part of book clubs and lenient circles and meetups like this one, where women could share their stories and, and just support each other. And that's me at an all women hackathon a few years ago. The second thing that happened around about that time was that a friend encouraged me to interview at an engineering for an engineering job at a technology NGO called Cell Life that had just started out of UCT. Um, I was much happier in this job. The team was much more diverse, as you can see, and um, it was a relief to be working on a team of people who didn't all look the same. I felt much more connected to my colleagues, much more connected to the products we were working on, and I was definitely much happier. Um, but along came another fork in the road then. As part of my job at Cell Life, I worked on an open source data collection tool that was used by health workers. Um, and this was a community, an open source community that was distributed across uh, different countries across the world. It was a really great experience. It taught me so much about code collaboration, about how to do good pull requests, how to follow the processes of the community. Um, and I definitely learned a lot. I would again recommend working on open source software, especially if you wanna get better at code collaboration. But the downside of all of this was that um, I found myself day in and day out, week after week, faced with um, some harsh code reviews and little or no encouragement from the other engineers in the, in the community because we were distributed and also no personal interaction with those engineers. Um, so I'm quite sensitive, so, so this was hard. Um, and it really came to a head for me one day when one of the senior engineers was lecturing me about a mistake I made in my pull request. And he just kept saying over and over again um, that everybody knows this is not how you do things. Um, maybe this will uh, relate to one of the, to the other talk later on. Um, so yeah, I just felt really discouraged. And I thought perhaps I didn't have what it takes to be an engineer after all. So I enrolled in a master's degree um, part-time in information systems because I thought I should start moving my career away from engineering and towards something else. Ironically, doing this master's degree kept me in the, in the same job because they gave really good study leave and uh, I could kind of keep studying and keep working as well. And while I kept coding and working um, and just writing code and stack overflowing and learning from my mistakes, I started to learn something very important that I think I knew in theory, but I really started learning it in practice. And that is that the phrase, everybody knows this, is a lie. Um, no one is born being a good engineer, as much as some people would like you to think this about them. And it's something we get better at as we study and work and learn from our mistakes. So I realized that if I love building things that have the potential to change people's lives and to bring them joy, then I should keep being an engineer, even if I'm not the smartest and most knowledgeable engineer that ever walked the planet. So I finished my master's degree and I decided to stay in engineering. I did a couple of um, other jobs after this. So more recently I spent time at Zorna in Cape Town 
Um, we were working on financial products that were used by customers in rural parts of uh, Malawi, Zambia, and Mozambique, which was really interesting. And this was also my first job working in a startup that did big funding rounds. So the environment was um, quite competitive and high pressure, but I really loved the challenge. This was also the first time that I got to be the lead in some of my software engineering teams, which is also a fantastic experience with me for me. And um, most days I really loved this job. This, uh, most days I really loved this job because we worked in an agile team um, that was very focused on solving customer and business problems. And um, we got to travel to the field and meet our customers, which was really interesting. And we got to really feel as engineers the impact that our um, our work, our successes, and our failure made on the, the customers and on the business. And um, again, this is something I'd really recommend is working on these kind of problem focused teams because I really learned a lot. I'm really rushing through my talk here. I don't know why, nerves. <laughs> um, so towards the end of my time at Zona, I worked on a big project where we basically wrote the core financial platform of the company and we also launched a new um, consumer, uh, consumer app on Android that I was working on. I had a key role in the team and it was really exhilarating and exciting working on this big launch, um, but I was also burning out. I was trying to take on more and more management responsibilities while still um, trying to do a lot of the, or almost all the technical work I was doing before myself as well. Um, my husband and I had been trying to fall pregnant and we had a failed pregnancy over this time. And basically I was just really struggling to maintain or to manage my stress. So once again, I just thought maybe this world of tech, maybe this world of being an engineer is just too much for me in the long run. And maybe this isn't where I belong. And so I did um, what one does in those situations. And I took a holiday. <laughs> I went to visit a friend of mine in the States. So this is a, if you can see the slide, this is me. Um, in New York and I just sort of slowed down and started thinking about what I wanted to do next and it was around that time that I realized that maybe it was okay for me to start moving away from trying to be the superstar individual contributor who sits in the corner and writes more code than anyone else does um, I think for many years I've been so afraid that people wouldn't see me as technical and I really made an effort to spend most of my energy doing technical work um, and writing code, which was great. And I'm really glad I did that. And I could have carried on doing that because it was fantastic. But um, I just realized that this wasn't the only definition of a successful engineer. And as an aside, if this is something that you've been thinking about, I would recommend a talk uh, called Being Glue by Tanya Riley. That was really helpful to me. So I knew that I could either carry on focusing on IC work if I wanted to, and that would be great, but I knew that I could also take on a different role um, in a different team if I want to. Um, basically, I realized I can do what I want to do, <laughs> which sounds really silly, but I think as women, we sometimes hold on so hard to this picture of what we think we should be um, and what we think success is, whether that's our own expectation or someone else's expectation. And sometimes it can be quite hard to let go of that. So a few months later, I was really excited to take on a new role at Luno in the web engineering team. And I was also lucky enough to land a manager who encouraged, who encouraged me to keep sort of exploring different roles in our engineering team. So ultimately I decided that I did want to try out the management track, which was a big, a big change for me. Um, but I'm so glad I did because I've found it really fulfilling and really rewarding so far. So I'm really glad that I gave myself the freedom to evolve and to do something new. I'm also really glad I stayed in tech. Um, having a baby and coming back has been challenging and that's probably the subject of another talk, but I'm really happy with where my career is at the moment. And I'm so glad that um, everything's sort of aligned that I didn't end up giving up on engineering. And that is the end of my talk tonight. And um, that's my journey so far. So thank you so much for listening, for giving me this opportunity. And, and if you wanna be friends, please get in touch. Thank you, Danae, that was really awesome. Um, so, guys, if you would like to ask Danae a question, please use the chat window on the right-hand side of 
um, your stream to ask some questions. And while, while you're busy typing away, we'll give you one or two minutes. I'm going to ask you some other questions. So, <laughs> Nick, um, you mentioned a whole bunch of resources. Can you um, just tell us about your favorite books, you, you know, your favorite business business books that you've um, read and that you that's been really influential for you? Hmm. Business books. I think, I mean, so I mentioned uh, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's TED Talk, and again, her book is possibly a bit outdated now, but her book Lean In was really, um, really inspirational for me at the time. Uh, the other resources are not so much books, but maybe I can link to some articles. Um, there's an article called Coding Like a Girl by Amy Wabowo that was really influential for me. And there's another one by Tracy Chu. Um, oh, I forget the title now, but I'll, I'll share it. Um, but basically, I think what I've just loved is reading other women's stories and hearing their challenges and, and sort of not feeling alone in that. That's great. Uh, OK, so Ntabi Singh is going to ask you a question. Let's just put it on the screen. Um, thanks for sharing. The question for me is, what were the major challenges that you, when you moved from being a dev to managing dev? <laughs> um, it really is just a totally different job. So everything was challenging. Uh, yeah, it would be, it would be tough to pick one thing. I think maybe um, the sort of success metrics that you have as an engineer or as a as a developer is your um, your pull request, your code, your features that you're shipping. And then suddenly when you're not doing those things hands on day to day, you have to find new success metrics. Um, and that was, that's been, I still haven't quite solved that. So that's been quite challenging, but yeah, but also refreshing to, to kind of take a different perspective on things. And then Etienne was asking, uh, what are some of the engineering management wisdoms that can give you energy and joy that you manage to collect throughout your journey? Oh, that's a tough one, putting me on the spot, Etienne. Um, I think I once heard someone, some, I haven't actually read that book, but the How to Win Friends and Influence People, and I heard someone summarize it as just, um, you have to find out what other people care about and then care about that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so I think just just really listening to people and and really finding out what they care about, whether it's your manager or the CEO of the company or the people you manage. I think that would that's one piece of hopefully wisdom that that I've learned recently. Uh, okay, and then there was just one last question. From Dino, um, what was the talk you re you recommended by Tanya Riley? So, uh, it's called um, it's called Being Glue. You can Google it. But what I'll do is I'll put all these resources on Meetup maybe as well and link to them. But but hopefully yeah. if you just Google Being Glue, it should come up. Cool. I think that's it for our questions tonight because we still have some two other talks to get through. But thank you so much, Danae. Have a lovely evening and look after little baby um, <laughs> very well. But thank you so much. You did awesomely. For and that was her first talk ever, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Great. Bye. Right. Let me just remove this. All right, so next up, guys, we've got um, Clara van Staden from Engineering Over coming to speak to us about um, her experiences learning an yet another language. Um, so Clara is an awesome human being, but she's also an awesome artist. So maybe if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we can see her cat pixel running around um, in the background. But if you're lucky, you, she will actually share her Instagram um, uh, handle for, for you, and then you can see your awesome art as well. She's a wonderful Go engineer, and let's hear her talk. Welcome, Clara. Okay, here we go. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello there. So today, I want to talk to you about yet another programming language this one called Go. 
If you sigh at the thought of another programming language, you are in good company. I felt very much the same when I learned that I would be learning Go. I hope I can teach you something about Go today and why it is a useful language, even though we already have so many languages to choose from. My name is Clara von Staden. I'm a backend engineer at Over. Over was acquired by GoDaddy in March 2020, and we went from a 70 person company to being part of a company with over 10,000 employees. Over is an app for communi visual communication and design that makes it easy to create compelling visual content for your brand and business. Apart from super cool design capabilities, the app also comes with content that is already licensed. If you want to check it out, it's currently free on web until 30 June. I included a link there for you. So when I started over last year, I was really excited to do Spring Boot and Kotlin. I did a bit of Spring Boot on the side um, at my previous job and I really enjoyed it. And I was super keen to do more of it. But then I got to over and I learned that the whole backend team suddenly started writing services in Go. That was a month after I interviewed, so it moved quite quickly. I was like, what is this language? Is it, is it a JVM language? I thought it was maybe a little bit like Groovy because it sounded a little bit like that, but I didn't tell anyone that, thankfully. I tried to hide my disappointment a bit and approach this new language with as much, as much enthusiasm as I could muster. So let me tell you a little bit about Go's history. It was developed in 2007 as a Google 20% project, which I thought was quite interesting. The creators are Robert Briesemer, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. These men all had very impressive histories in computer science. Thompson and Pike worked together at Bell Labs and were both involved in the creation of Unix. Thompson invented B, which is a direct predecessor of C. Griesemer previously worked on code generation for Google's V8 JavaScript engine. They developed Go as a solution to scaling problems at Google. And they launched the first version in 2009 and open sourced it. In 2012, 1.0 was released. The whole premise behind Go is that the more features a language has, the more complexity it introduces. And that's not always a great thing. So all that being said, let me introduce you to the features that they decided to leave out. I must warn you, it may come as a bit of a shock. Go has no inheritance, no exceptions, no classes, no generics, no function annotations, no constructors and destructors, and no statics. So, I asked after I saw this, with all these features in object-oriented programming that we've come to learn and love, how, how can this language still be useful at all? So let me share a little bit um, with you why I think it's amazing. Go is extremely fast and it, its performance comes close to C because Go is compiled to machine code and outperforms interpreted languages or languages that have virtual runtimes. This makes Go a solid option where lightning fast execution is required and why it's excellent for APIs. It has a very small memory footprint. I learned this first handed over and I'd like to share a little story about this. Um, there was a particularly naughty Go service that ran um, using 512 megabytes of memory. Our team investigated um, and thought it might be a memory leak. When they actually looked at the service, it was still a Spring Boot service running um, using Kotlin. So it was actually not a Go service at all. And our Go services typically run between eight and 16 megabytes of memory. As you may think, it is a dream to run in the cloud. It has a very small deployment. Um, you only deploy a single binary and you're good to go. It is a super lightweight language. It only has 23 keywords, so it's quite easy to learn and this, the syntax is quite simple. The development cycle is also very light. Um, it compiles very quickly, testing is included, and the setup is very easy. Go has a 
batteries include a standard lib, and I love this. Go comes out with production ready HTTP service. Um, sorry, server. Crypt 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 sorry, cryptography, database connectors, and built in testing. It's a statically typed language which means variable types are explicitly declared and de thus determined at compile time. This decreases the likelihood of runtime errors and IDE suggestions are great. It, it, Go is, is, has an open source license, which is fantastic because there's no corporate overlords co coming to hunt you down for licensing fees. Go also has garbage collection, which makes coding less error prone and it's less difficult than languages than C++. The following graph sums up Go's positioning very well. Go aims to be fast and fun for humans without sacrificing performance. For a long time, Java helped this trophy position, but I would argue there is a new kid on the block. Now that I've told you a little bit about Go's history and why it is awesome, I would be in the wrong not to at least give you a taste of what it looks like. I hope you can see this. Um, this is a classic example of um, what we would see as a class in other programming languages. Go's class equivalent is called a struct. As you can see, we have a struct with two fields and our struct's name is cat. As I have said before, Go does not have any constructors, but we can add our own methods that act as constructors anyway. The naming convention doesn't matter. I could have called it new cat or new unicorn and it would have been fine. Below the constructor, you will see a list of setters and getters. Do you notice the little C cat in brackets? We call that a pointer receiver and it indicates the struct that the method will be performed on. Go is the main package that invokes the program. You will see that I create a new cat object whose name is of course pixel and I can greet pixel using the name getter. Go uses capitalization of variables to indicate some meaning. What the hell does that mean? Well, let me explain to you, it's actually quite simple. Um, in Go, fields that start with a capital letter indicate that it is a public variable as we would know in other languages. If it is lowercase, it means it can't be accessed outside of the package. See how I use the name directly now? So I can use pixel's name without the getter. If I were to change that field back to a lowercase, I would get a compile time error saying that I can't access an unexported field. The same principle holds for methods. All your public methods start with an uppercase and all the pub private ones with the lowercase. One of my favorite features of Go is that it won't even compile if there are unused variables. Amazing, clean language built into a language. Another one of my favorite features of Go is sensible defaults. In this example, I declare an integer, but I don't set any value to it. Notice how I can use it immediately. And in the console, you can see that I print it out and it's a zero. This is a really cool feature where Go's defaults are set to sensible values. For instance, if you declare a string, it will be an empty string until you use it. I love this example too. It really shows how powerful this feature is. In this example, I have a struct with an integer and a mutex lock. Notice how I can use the mutex lock immediately without having to initialize it. Go has a bunch of cheeky proverbs that are one-liners that describe the trade-offs that the language makes. There are a bunch of them, but these ones are my favorites. Make the zero value useful. This is the feature I showed you before where you can just use a variable after declaring it. GoFont style is no one's favorite. Yes, GoFont is everyone's favorite. Go has a code formatter that f formats code in a way that's no one's favorite, but the consistency is so awesome that everyone loves it and don't really care about the style. Clear is better than clever. I think this value applies to most software and is a guiding principle of Go. Reflection is never clever. 
This one is quite controversial and I'll leave it at that. And I'll just say that Go does have a reflection built in at least. A little copying is better than a little dependency. I had to make peace with this one. I really hate duplication. I was trying to find a toolbar like lib to extract a certain field out of a struct. And I asked my colleague, isn't there like a lodash or something that I can use to get this value out of the struct? And he laughed and sent me this proverb. Since then, I've sort of made peace with it, and I see, see the point in sometimes having a little bit more verbose but clear code. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that it is interesting, why is it worthwhile to learn Go? Is it just me who thinks this? This is a crazy quote from Shopify CEO. Shopify and many other impressive software companies like Uber, Twitch, SoundCloud, Dropbox, and Medium are betting on Go. Let me share some interesting statistics with you. For the third year in a row, Go is the number one language that developers want to learn next, according to Hacker and 2020 Developer Skill Reports. In the Stack Overflow's 2020 Developer Survey, Go is number four on the most loved programming list and number three on the most wanted programming list. In South Africa, if you want to make big bucks, your best bet is Ruby or Go, presumably because both are rather niche. In the Hacker Rank, sorry, in the Hacker News hiring trends, which I understand is mostly US based, Go is number four on the top programming language list when it comes to employers looking for developers with certain skills. It has even beaten Java, which now stands at number five. So now that I have maybe convinced you of Go's epicness, I would be in the wrong not to tell you about the controversies. My husband, who is a Java Spring Boot expert and quite like the language and framework, recently played around with Go. I was reminded of my initial misgivings and I'd like to share them with you. The first complaint is, where are my frameworks? Sometimes people say that there are a lack of frameworks that provide major boilerplating. That's not to say there are no frameworks. Po popular Go frameworks are Jim, Revel, Bigo, Echo and others. In my opinion, those frameworks don't always necessitate using them because they provide very lightweight features. For instance, they would provide a response wrapping and router wrapping that makes it a little bit easier to do those things. But to me, it doesn't really make that much sense. This sentiment seems to be echoed by the community as well. The JetBrains developer survey of 2019 records that 46% of Go developers use no framework at all. It will be very interesting to see if this changes, and I think it very well, very well might as more developers from other languages come to Go. And I think that would be a good thing. The second complaint is something that may become a bit of a pain, and we've seen this at Over as well. If you have lots of Go microservices, Every developer picks a different package structure and different libraries, and your microservice complexity grows quite a bit. I'll tell you how we worked around this a bit in the next slide. The last complaint, and I think some people might be very upset with this, but some design patterns can't be implemented because there is no inheritance. But I would say it's hardly ever necessary, but I guess that's an opinion. With these counter arguments in mind, I found that Uber had very similar challenges to what I just described. In her GoForCon 2019 talk, Elena Morozova describes how Uber mitigated these, these things. Firstly, they created a dependency injection framework called FX. This allowed them to inject common functions into their services, like a logger. The logger would already be set up with the right format and configuration. When dependencies need to be updated, they just update the DI container rather than all the dependent services. They also standardized on their package structures, so it would be recognizable to developers working on different services. They also switched from many service repos to one single repository, 
there's someone on our team that really would like this. And over, we've done more or less the same, a bit less formalized because we aren't as many developers as Uber, but we've done some things that mitigate those complaints. We've created internal libraries for common functionality. For instance, we have a kit that, that wraps the router and we have some kits that do microservice bootstrapping and injects loggers, that kind of thing. We also have a common package structure that we more or less adhere to, and we've agreed on some co common limbs. So if, I've, if I have convinced you to learn Go, here are some awesome resources. I would really recommend starting with this video. Uh, Steve Frankia's video um, is Go, building on the shoulders of giants and stepping on a few toes. I found this really helpful because it, it shows you where Go came from and the mentality behind it and how they wrote the language. A tour of Go is really useful if you want to learn some Go syntax and get to know the language a bit. How to write Go code is a very practical guide on starting your first module and it introduces you to Go modules, uh, which is Go, Go's preferred package manager and how to start a project. And with that, thanks for listening. I hope you learned something and you want to add Go to your dev tool belt. I want to give a special thanks to two of my colleagues, um, Wayne Berry, who's taught me everything that I know about Go that's well. And all the things I said wrong is purely me. Um, and Ulrich, who helped me, who listened to my first nervous repetition of this talk. So thank you for them. And then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Cool, thank you, um, Clara. So I was wondering, um, did you draw those gophers yourself? Or did I you wish I did, they were so <laughs> nice, but I didn't, I found them online. Uh, I, I, um, I referenced them, they, um, someone drew them, they were so nice. I think they're open it, store, so. Is it Ashley McNamara? Cause she usually um, runs, does my the idea, yeah. gopher stuff. Yeah, she's very cool. Okay, guys, um, if you have any questions for Clara, please remember to add them to the um, side, the right side there, and I'll, I'll prompt her. Um, so, Clara, um, the one thing that I just wanted to mention was I, when I was thinking of learning Go, there's a book called Head First Go um, from um, the same company that does head first i think it's it might be o'reilly or something and they it's it's a very um interactive kind of book with like puzzles and um pictures and all kinds of crazy stuff inside it's that's a very, also a very good resource head first go oh, awesome that's cool but, but it's, um, it's a thick book <laughs> okay you want to be a go expert after you've read that yes so, um, Rudwana would like to ask, um, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome when you learned Go? Um, I think the biggest thing was um, when I initially approached it, I thought it would be very similar to all the other languages that I learned. So I, I thought um, if I could do Python and Java, I can apply those exact principles to Go. And I found that the mentality shift was um, bigger than I anticipated. Like some things that are good patterns in other languages would be an anti-pattern in Go. Like I said, with a little bit of duplication is okay in Go, little things like that. Um, and just the fact that there's no inheritance and um, interfaces are implicit, little things like that tripped me up. And I think it took me a good six months until I really felt like I had the language principles. Um, I, could, I could code in it quite early, but to become good at it, I think, took me a few months. Okay, and um, your colleague Rebecca would like to ask, would you like to go back to Kotlin and Java? <laughs> I feel like that's a, a loaded question. So um, <laughs> we, we still have um, a very large API that's written in um, Spring Boot and Kotlin, and I sometimes uh, do some PRs on it, and I quite enjoy it. So I'd actually like to do it a little bit more. Um, I also don't think it's an either or thing that um, Kotlin 
is not as cool as Go and vice versa. I think each of them have, have their strengths and Go is very controversial. It's a completely different mindset. Cool, let's see if there's any. Um, Tandeka would like to know, must I have some knowledge of JavaScript in order to learn Go? No, not at all. So it's a, a server side language um, and it, it's quite different. To me, it's almost closer to C++ than it is to Java, but that's my opinion. But it's not as hard as C++, thank goodness. Cool, thank you. And then lastly, Tabi Singh, we'd like to ask, is Go closer to functional programming? So Go has some functional programming elements, but it's not considered a functional programming language by itself. Um, they also, so Go um, has a bunch of uh, suggestions that people make to expand the language and that's one of the common things that people ask for so they might introduce more of that in the future cool and then our last question Peter Lowe would like to know what's your favorite go keyword <laughs> oh my goodness um, that's a difficult one I would say struct because um, it reminded me of C++ and then um, I felt immediately like oh I don't want to do C++ and then it actually um, ended up being awesome. So I think I like the struct keyword quite a bit. That's a cool question. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Clara. Um, please have a nice cuddle with Pixel, your little cat today. And um, thank you very much for your talk. It was really great. Okay. Thanks for having me, Pamela. Okay, uh, next up we've got our lovely speaker, Lizette Spannenberg. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Let's just yes, you are. <laughs> Great. Okay, so Lizette is a is the UX UI um, practice lead at DDT. Um, she's also doing her PhD in UX things. Very clever lady, and she also plays the violin in several orchestras, which I find extremely exciting. So take it away. Thank you. Cool, thank you so much. And thanks for having me tonight, everyone. Um, so I'm not a developer, I am in fact a designer. Um, please forgive me for that. But I, at the same time, I am a woman who is working in the tech space. And when I was thinking about, about my journey through tech, I started thinking about things that had been said to me. And some of the things were frustrating, some of them were quite hilarious, some of them were just absurd. And I figured I'd share my journey and the things that have um, affected me and helped me to grow and learn. And hopefully that can help you to grow and learn as well. So firstly, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. So um, I'm the practice lead uh, for UX and UI at uh, DBT, custom cons um, software consultancy. I'm busy with my PhD. Um, I'm looking at health humanities, so how design can help healthcare. Um, I play violin in 1800s cover band, which is all a uh, symphony orchestra really is. And then I love adventure. So I love traveling and going um, to different countries. Uh, at the moment, I'm traveling between my kitchen and uh, my living room for the most part. Uh, so very exciting, but you know, hopefully we'll have a chance to uh, explore a bit further after it, everything has calmed down this year. So, as I said, um, I've been a woman in tech for about nine, 10 years now. And the biggest thing that kept standing out to me is that it's not that so much that I was a woman in tech that frustrated me, it's that I was being treated like a girl in tech, um, someone not to be taken seriously, someone to be dismissed. And so that sort of had, was expected to just shush while you know the adults were talking in the room for no discernible reason. Um, and another thing that I've realized throughout my career is that so many people have told me that I'm either too much something or not enough of something. And very often these things were at odds with each other. So being too emotional, but not being empathetic enough. And I always had this big struggle within myself feeling that I, you know, I, I was somehow misplaced or I wasn't focusing my attention in the right place. And through a long journey, I've come to realize that all of these things tend to be hang-ups that other people have and that they were projecting onto me. So drum roll, please, we'll get onto the memes, which I know, which is what everyone is waiting for. 
So I'm sure everyone has either experienced this or at least seen this uh, happening to someone. Being called a pet name like, hey babe, babe, sweetie, darling, angel pet. Um, I've experienced this from men and from women from all sorts of different ages. And for the most part, I've often experienced this from, you know, the, the well-meaning office mother. I'm sure you all know that person I'm talking about. They mean well. They really don't mean to um, single you out or to make you feel different. They're trying to comfort you, to make you feel part of the space. But ironically, what they're doing is undermining you. And they're making other people around you think like, oh, shame, you know, she's a poor little baby. We, we need to help her. And she can't carry her own weight. And it's so frustrating um, because we're competent, strong people, but it makes you doubt yourself. Like, okay, but I'm, I'm out of the house. I'm working. I'm an adult now, or am I? Because I'm being babied. And it's frustrating to get people to understand that while well-meaning, this kind of language doesn't really help people for the most part. I was once told that, uh, right at the start of my career, that at your age, I wasn't even invited to these kinds of meetings. You should be grateful. And I found it so insulting. Um, this was from an intermediate designer that said this to me. Um, because at, when she was a junior, she hadn't been invited to um, planning meetings. And I found this so odd because it's not that she was a bad designer or that I was incredibly good. It's just this was the situation that was happening. And somehow she was jealous and wanted to um, cut me out of the meeting for the, because of this jealousy, which makes no sense. We should be helping one another and helping each other grow. There is no point to insult people and to sort of try and chip away at them to make them feel like less because what does that help in the end? We're part of the same team trying to do the same thing and we need to help each other get there. You should have more empathy. So this one was a lot of fun. Um, the backstory is that um, I was told to have more empathy because a coworker's workload was dumped onto me without me being told or consulted or anything like that. And at the same time, yes, you do obviously want to help people out. But when there's no context given, you don't understand what's going on. And all of a sudden, you have to deal with everything this other person has promised without any explanation. It's really frustrating. Um, so later on, it came out uh, when I was saying that this is um, something that we should maybe just look at how we can address this and avoid it happening in future. I was told that I should have more empathy because this co-worker's uh, grandmother had been sick and um, was struggling to deal with uh, the situation. And I really felt for this person, I felt that yes, it's something that really um, we could have pulled together as a team. But first of all, I didn't know what was happening. So in my eyes, they were just shirking their responsibility. The other detail was my own mother was in ICU for two weeks during that time when I was doing two people's work. Um, so it's very frustrating to be told that I should be empathetic to other people when at the same time, people are not empathetic towards me. So yes, I also didn't tell people what was happening in my life. Um, so I don't blame them for that. But it's very easy to say that you should always be considerate of what's going on, of the fact that you don't know what's going on in other people's lives if you yourself is not, uh, are not doing the same. So having too much empathy or too little empathy, it's a bit of a sticking point because having a lot of empathy for people can also very easily sort of make you a doormat and people take advantage of that. And as a designer, as a UX designer, as a person, I try and have always have empathy and to help people wherever I can, but it's very difficult often if you don't have the context and to allow you to have that understanding. And then on the flip side, we have the other one, which is why are you so emotional? Um, I had a very fun manager, which uh, was not very nice. And uh, the precursor to the story is they had screamed at me in an open plan office so loudly that everyone in the open plan office went very quiet 
because I had asked why we were doing something a certain way. I was trying to understand. And I was told that I will do as I am told. So I got quiet, got up, went outside to calm myself down because I do not deal well with confrontation. And um, yeah, the manager asked me, why are you being so emotional? I'm like, because you just screamed at me in front of everyone. And apparently being upset wasn't the right reaction to that. Um, and it's frustrating. We're not, hum well, we are humans, we're not robots. We do have emotions and that needs to be considered. And you can't treat someone terribly and then be surprised when they're upset about it. I even told them that I didn't appreciate the way that they were speaking to me and that they really didn't like, which is crazy because again, we don't know what's happening in other people's lives and you can't just treat people terribly because you're having a bad day. I've seen that many times, people taking out their emotions and feelings on their coworkers. And we all have bad days sometimes, but you need to understand that, especially if you are in a senior position and manager position, as my manager was at that point, you can't just take things out on your subordinates or even your coworkers and expect them to just take it. He never apologized for me for that inst instance. Um, in fact, he held me accountable for my emotional state, which he felt was completely overreacting, um, which is frustrating because, as I said, we're not robots. Um, if someone's going to scream at me, I'm going to become upset. And instead of screaming back, I went outside to calm myself down. So you, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't tell people they're too much of something and too little of something else at the same time. And I've often found that as a woman, I'm expected to sort of just deal with other people's emotions and almost in a way, a little bit of mothering. I'm expected to care and, you know, just, just take that when people lash out, uh, which I'm sure my mother took a lot off from me when I was a teenager, but I'm nobody's mother. And while I'm very happy to help a coworker, if you're going to take things for granted, it's going to be difficult. So another fun one is, uh, you're a woman, you should understand. So in this specific instance, um, there were about five children under the age of 10 that were screaming and running around in our open plan office. Um, I don't deal very well with children. Um, I get very overwhelmed by noise and distraction and things. And I was, I. I sort of just sighed and carried on working. I didn't even say anything. And funnily enough, the same manager as the previous story, um, told me that, you know, you're a woman, you should understand that, you know, kids are rowdy. And the thing is, again, you can't assume what someone else should be understanding, especially not because of their gender. The person might have um, a, uh, um, a sensitivity to noise or to movement. The person might uh, be a mother and they are overwhelmed at home. The person might even have had um, a miscarriage recently, which was really weighing on them. And therefore seeing lots of children in the office really upset them. You can't presume to know what's going on in someone else's mind and throwing their gender at them makes absolutely no sense. I think I've decided that this little girl is uh, my spirit animal. I do not like being told to smile. And um, I've been told a few times that um, I should add emojis to messages just to seem friendlier. Um, when I'm at work, I want to work and I want to get things done. I'm polite and I'm friendly, but I'm not going to ask you, hey, how's it going? You know, would you mind, please, maybe just if you could get the time sending me those files we talked about, you would be such a sweetheart and you would make my day. Um, ain't nobody got time for that. Um, I'll just send you a message and say, hey, when you get, get the time, can you send me the files we talked about? And I was, I have been repeatedly told that apparently I come across as incredibly rude. So I should start adding emojis. Now, I have never in my life heard of a male coworker that has been told to add emojis to seem friendlier or nicer. Um, all that has ever been addressed for um, sending straightforward mails. Now there's a difference between being straightforward and being rude. 
very aware of that. And I am very aware that it can be very easy. It is very easy to misinterpret tone in a text. So adding in nice words um, is very important. And I have worked on my tone. But adding in emojis, and especially heart emojis and smiley emojis, is not something that I necessarily believe really belong in a business context. Slack is a different story, and custom emojis are awesome. Um, some things can only be conveyed during uh, through custom emojis, but you know, if I'm sending a message to the CEO, I'm probably not going to be adding emojis. Ah, the the classic one. Let me explain it to you. And ironically enough, this has been said to me a few times by women, um, which I don't understand um, why someone would ever say this to someone that they are trying to explain something to, because it immediately makes you feel like, but you did just explain this. Um, in this specific context, the person that explained something to me um, I told them that, okay, I don't quite agree with the way they want to do it. Could we try a different way? And the response was, no, no, clearly you don't understand. Let me, let me explain it to you. And I pretty much had this look on my face because I understand exactly what you just said. I just don't agree with you. And they proceeded to explain it to me twice again after that. Someone else had to ask them to stop explaining to me. Um, just because I'm disagreeing with you doesn't mean that I don't understand. Um, I'm just not, uh, don't think that your way might be the best way to do something. Ah, if you could just learn to be more agreeable, you'd be a great designer. This was said to me by a client who was unhappy that I didn't do their bidding when asked. Um, they would try and pull in extra features in the middle of sprints. They would ignore the definition of done before stories were picked up. Um, they would try and push stories through that were not um, had not gone through the proper QA processes. And then they would berate the developer team for the stories having bugs in them. So I was the most senior person on the team. So I started putting my foot down and saying that, no, actually, we cannot take the story on because it has not been signed off and the correct definition of done has not been met. And there was a lot of unhappiness from the client. They assumed that because I was a woman, they would be able to bully me into actually doing what they wanted. They specifically made a point of never doing this in front of the male engineering lead. They would only do it when I was there because they assumed I would roll over. Clearly, they didn't know me very well. So there's this thinking that, you know, women should be ladies and women should, you know, be demure and do what we're told. And I wouldn't quite agree with that. Um, and there's an excerpt of a video called um, uh, Be a Lady, they said, which is uh, which was created by... Um, um, Girls, Girls, Girls magazine, and it's read by Cynthia Nixon. And I have a short excerpt, excerpt of that video to show you quickly. Be a lady, they said. Don't talk too loud. Don't talk too much. Don't be intimidating. Why are you so miserable? Don't be a bitch. Don't be so bossy. Don't be so emotional. Don't cry. Don't yell. Don't swear. Endure the pain. Don't complain. Fold his clothes. Cook his dinner. Keep him happy. That's a woman's job. You'll make a good wife someday. Take his last name. You hyphenated your name. Crazy feminist. Give him children. You don't want children? You will someday. So that's just a quick excerpt from the video. Um, the video itself is a bit not safe for work. Um, so I didn't show the full thing here. Um, if you want to, I would highly recommend it. It is a very powerful message. Um, parts of it may be a little bit upsetting though. Um, and I just find that such a beautiful way that they've put it, sort of all these stereotypes of um, you should, and parts of the video that talk about, oh, you should eat more. Oh, but why are you eating so much? And it's all these um, things that keep being said to women that are so contradictory and that makes it so difficult to really understand, but 
who you should be in business and where you fit in. So um, a few things that I've learned through this process is, first of all, to stand up for yourself. It took me a while to really sort of muster the courage because, as I said, I'm not really a very confrontational person. But I realized that if I don't stand up for myself, no one else is going to. If someone is talking over you in a meeting, tell them, sorry, I was still speaking. I was in a meeting once where a lady did that and the entire room just went quiet. And like, no one could believe that she had told them, sorry, I'm still speaking. And the sad reality is very often if you don't do that, you're not going to um, be able to finish your sentence. And it's happened to me so many times um, luckily not with my current team, um, because they actually have respect for other people. Um, but I've been in so many meetings in the past where people just talk over you. And if you don't put your foot down, you're never going to get your chance to actually speak or to show your work or whatever it might be that you are struggling with. Um, trust your gut. I have spent so many years second guessing myself and I overthink things. I overthink everything constantly. And it's taken me a very long time to understand that if I think that's something we should maybe be doing something. Uh, when I was junior, I was too afraid to speak up and I'd be like, ah, so there's something about this that's not quite working, but I'm maybe not quite sure. So I, I'm too shy to say something. Now I go for it. I'm like, something here is not working. I'm not sure what yet. We'll figure it out. But we're going to try and rework this. And the more I've done that, the more I've realized that more often than not, I find that I, that hunch, that's sort of just somewhere in the back of your head, it's right. And I've found so many insights and so many ways that have worked for me. Um, and it's really empowering to realize that you can do that. There is a little voice that tells you when you should speak up and when you should stand up for yourself. And maybe even just you're like, ah, you know, maybe maybe I should refactor this thing just once more. When you get the time, do it, because something is telling you you can do this better or differently in some way. And uh, just know that you can do that. There is a reason why you have intuition, trust it. I've often found that as a woman, I'm held to a different standard. Um, I can think of, many instances, but there's one specifically where uh, I forgot to sign off a document. Um, I worked in an agency where we had to sign off documents before it went to client. I forgot to give the physical signature before I left um, for home for the day. Uh, the project manager called me and told me to come back into the office. Um, I took the call train, so I had to walk back three blocks and go and sign it. And then I found out that my male colleague who needed to say, sign the same document, she signed it on his behalf because, you know, oh, shame, he, he always forgets, it's fine. But because I'm the responsible one who always does it, I was in trouble for not doing the responsible thing as I always do. And that frustrates me so much that because I acted to a different standard, I was held to that different standard. I wasn't allowed to make to slip up and make mistakes, but because um, my male colleague had, he was expected to, you know, make mistakes so he could carry on. And I don't know, maybe if it had been a female colleague, it might have been different. Maybe it would have been the same. I don't know. But I do know of many instances where me as the woman, I've been expected to take notes in meetings where I've had to tell people, I'm sorry, I can't take notes. I'm the person presenting. I can't take notes in my own meeting. And I find that it's absurd that you have to clarify those kinds of things. Then I've also found, as I've mentioned a few times now, yes, I've experienced sexism in my um, career, but also ageism. Because I was young, because I was afraid to speak up, people treated me differently. I know of colleagues who've been told that their seniors didn't want to take them with into meetings that were about their projects because it would make them look bad that a junior was working on this. A junior who was doing incredibly good work, but they were afraid they would be judged because a junior was working on it, which makes no sense because if a junior is doing incredible work, you should be proud of them. 
And you should be telling everyone that this person is doing awesome work, look at this great job, instead of being threatened and feeling intimidated by this person, you should be building them up and helping them grow. Um, I often say to our graduates and to juniors that I work with, just because you're younger, it doesn't mean that your opinion is invalid. Yes, the senior developers uh, might have a specific reason why they're doing something differently. Ask them, if you have a different way of doing something, if you can think of a different way of doing something, ask them, suggest it. If it's not a good idea, then they can help you learn to grow. Well, you, you might very often be wrong, don't get me wrong. But on the other hand, because you haven't been in industry that long, because you haven't been as jaded, as, because you're not as set in your ways, you might have a completely different approach, which is very novel and which might be a brilliant solution that they haven't thought of be exactly because they have been working for longer. So don't ever let that um, keep you back and make you feel that your contribution isn't valid. And then we need to support other women. So throughout my career, I have never had uh, female mentors um, or senior female designers working above me. And don't get me wrong, I've been lucky to learn from some incredible men that have taught me a lot. And I just wish that I had had the opportunity to learn from other women because we do deal with other situations and other things that our men do. So I'm trying to be that person and I'm hoping to be that mentor for other juniors that I wish that I'd had the opportunity to be. So I hope that you guys have all learned a bit today from the other amazing women that also spoke. And thank you so much, DD, for giving us the platform to do this and to share our experiences with people. And then I think this is one of my last points is confidence is key. As I said, you need to believe in what you know and what you think before other people are going to believe you. So the way that I managed to get out of that area where I was junior and people didn't really, eh, like, they're like, yeah, you know things, but, you know, um, the thing that got me out of that was being confident and believing in myself and trusting that intuition that I had in terms of what I thought would work and just believing in what I can do. And it sounds so cliche, and it's so easy to say when you've already sort of gotten there, but not that I think that I know everything, there's a lot I still need to learn. Um, the day you stop learning is the day you die, I believe is a saying somewhere. But you need to be confident and know that you have value to add. So I think to finish off, I have a video by, I think it's always Ultra, um, they did an ad a few years ago about what it means to do things like a goal and how we actually stereotype ourselves. Hi, Aaron. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Here. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> Now throw like a girl. Aww. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. My name is Dakota, and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So I just find that such a beautiful message and just this idea that when did like a girl become an insult? Uh, women are powerful and I think especially in the business place, in the business world, um, we often try to act like men because it's a men's world, but what's the point? We're not men, we're never going to be men and we shouldn't be, we're women and that's what makes us powerful.
And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, feel free to find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I post things about cats and memes, um, and every now and then things about design and space stations. Um, yes. Uh, Danae made a comment that everyone should code like a girl. And I think that's a very beautiful sentiment. True. So Liz, um, where are you going to be speaking next? I heard a little birdie tweet something. <laughs> yes, I'm speaking at, um, what's it? Um, Women who code uh, New York on yes. next Monday night. So I'm talking well, about um, user experience and machine learning. So in lots of different ways that machine learning is creating new opportunities for UX design. So it's interesting because with the time difference, I'll be speaking at 11 o'clock at night, our time, which is five o'clock their afternoon. So luckily I don't have to get up in the middle of the night. I am a night owl at least. Cool. So um, Verena would like to know what was the name of the video you took the first snippet from? Um, that video is called uh, Be a Lady and it was posted by Girls, Girls, Girls magazine. I'll post the link to the video on the Meetup page as well. I think, um, well, obviously you weren't able to see the stream of comments coming through while you were speaking, but I think um, what was the most um, common sentiment was how relatable your talk was and how, um, how often, you know, people see what you're talking about in their own experience and so on and so on. So thank you so much for speaking to us. I'm just going to give a minute or two to, to see if there's any other questions, but let's just um, show you some of the comments, like Kushal saying, wow. Thank you. <laughs> saying, powerful, thank you. Etienne um, saying, powerful talk, thank you. So well done, does it. Of okay. course. No, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It was lovely having the chance to chat to everyone. And I think that's part of the thing. We These kinds of things women often don't talk about because you don't want to seem like someone who can't hack it. So you don't want to, people to realize that you're struggling with a certain thing. And we need to be more open when people say weird things and call them out on it. Like, but what did you mean by that? And sort of just make them stop and think about what they're actually saying. Because there's this ingrained culture that people sort of just often say things and don't, you know, take have a second thought about it. And that's silly. People should really think about how you're interacting with other people because it affects them as it should. Yes. Thank you so much, Lizette, and have a lovely evening for there. Thank you, you too. Have a good night. All right. So we've come to the end of our session tonight. Um, thank you so much for attending. So this is the link and the QR codes to our lovely survey. So our survey is going to be open until 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. And two lucky winners are going to win some JetBrains prizes and we'll email them through to you um, probably within the next couple of days. So we'd really like to encourage you to, um, to, add, to, to add your comments, your thoughts to the speakers. You know, did they do well? Did they, you know, is there something they can work on? Is there something GDG can work on? Are there topics that you want to hear about next? So we'd really appreciate your feedback, and I'm going to keep this on the screen so long. But thank you for attending tonight. It was awesome to have you. It was awesome to have some audience interaction that was a little bit better than last time. Um, thank you for your patience. If you were here last time, thank you for coming back. And I hope to see all of you here again next month where we're going to have a very special and a very secret um, meetup that might involve a Googler coming. With that, good night. Uh, and remember to fill in the survey. Bye-bye.